Well, hello back. We're going to talk about how to use spectroscopy to figure out the structure of a molecule. Um, we'll have two examples that we're going to go through, and we'll start from pretty much nothing other than the spectra. Uh, but we're going to use the mass spectra, the infrared spectra, and the NMR spectra to come up with the structure of a molecule. So let's start with the first example. The following spectra is all the information that we're going to have in order to elucidate the structure of this molecule. And as you'll see in a second, I'm going to actually give you some numbers, pinpoint which signals may be split into, you know, doublets, triplets, that kind of thing. And based on all the information taken together, we're going to figure out the structure of this molecule. Uh, the first thing that we need to do is look at the mass spec. So let's zoom in into this region. Now for the mass spec of this molecule, what you will notice is that the peaks that appear the highest in the spectrum are the peak at 70 uh, with 38.1% and then the peak at 71, 2.1%. And these two peaks represent your M plus and your M plus plus one peaks. Okay, so now, um, what we're going to do is, now that we recognize that as being the M plus peak, we need to scale it back to 100%. All right, and like I said, if this is the M plus peak, the one directly above it, the one at 2.1%, that's your M plus plus one peak. So what we're going to do is simply scale this back to 100%. And the easiest way to do this is to look at the value, the percentage value for the M plus peak, and simply we divide it by itself. And once that happens, we end up with one. So all that's left to be done is to multiply that by 100. And this is how we will scale back the M plus peak into 100%. Now for the M plus plus one peak, what we do is we take the 2.1%, but we do not divide it by 2.1. We divide it by the 38.1 because what we're really doing right here is scaling the entire mass spec spectrum uh, based on the M plus peak itself. So we're going to divide this by 38.1 and multiply by 100. So whatever you did to the M plus peak, you do to the M plus plus 1 peak. And if there was an M plus plus 2 peak, you will do that as well for that peak. Divided by the percentage of the M plus peak, multiplied by 100. And so what happens now is that the M plus peak ends up being 100%. The M plus plus 1 is now uh, recalibrated and we're showing a 5.5% associated with the peak at 71. All right, so here we utilize this information to figure out how many carbons we have in this molecule. And you may recall that to determine the number of carbons from the value, the percentage value of the M plus plus one peak, we simply divide that percentage by 1.1%, which is in essence the abundance of carbon 13. So 5.5 divided by 1.1, is equal to five and what this is telling us is that there are five carbons present in this molecule now carbon has an atomic mass of 12 grams per mole and this is the most abundant isotope of carbon so carbon 12 12 grams per mole uh, if you multiply the five carbons by 12 this gives you the overall mass that a mole of this molecule would contain so 60 grams uh, due to the five carbons being present in the molecule. Now the peak, the M plus peak falls at 70, at a mass of 70. So what we do is we subtract the mass of the five carbons, uh, 60, from the total mass of the compound, the M plus peak uh, mass of 70. So 70 minus 60 is 10 grams. And since hydrogen has a mass of one, uh, this is telling us that this could have 10 hydrogens. And because if you do have five carbons, you can contain up to 12 hydrogens due to the alkane formula, um, 10 hydrogens is absolutely uh, possible. You can definitely have 10 hydrogens within five carbons. So this is perfect. We have determined how many hydrogens, how many carbons this molecule is going to contain. And this comes directly from the M plus and the M plus plus one peaks of the spectrum. Okay, now, the next thing that I would recommend that you guys do is look at the IHD. And 
in particular, what we need to pay attention to once we have the chemical formula is the number of carbons in the formula as well as the number of hydrogens, the number of equivalent hydrogens, if you will. And the formula, you might recall, is determined in terms of how many equivalent hydrogens your entire compound contains based on what's given in this table. So first of all, when you look at your formula, all of the hydrogens count as being equivalent. But, however, if you do have halogens represented by X right here, so if you have fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine, you count them as if they were hydrogens. Uh, oxygens and sulfurs, if your structure were to have those particular elements, you would simply ignore them in terms of the count for, you know, how many hydrogens there are. But if you did have nitrogen or phosphorus, you will have to subtract one hydrogen for every nitrogen or every phosphorus that your formula contained. So the way we figure out this index of hydrogen deficiency is by uh, plugging the 2n plus 2 value where n is the number of carbons in the formula. So notice the color scheme. Uh, so we're going to plug in 5 for n. And the number of equivalent hydrogens is simply how many hydrogens we have here. There is no nitrogen, there's no halogen, so 10, which is present in the formula, is exactly the number of equivalent hydrogens. So we're just going to change that. And now we're going to multiply. So 2 times 5 is 10, 10 plus 2 is 12. 12 minus 10 is 2, and 2 divided by 2 is 1. Now the value of the IHD, you may recall from a previous lecture, and in case you don't remember, I'm going to have the link in the description below so you can you know, watch those videos in case you need some extra background. But having an IHD of 1, you may remember, is representative of your molecule either having a double bond or being a ring structure. It's either or. You know, not both, just either or. Um, so we're going to keep ourselves to this uh, constraints to try to figure out what the structure is. But this is already giving us some information as to how this is going to look like. All right, so now, knowing that there's going to be either an alkene or a ring system, it might be useful to look at the infrared spec uh, spectrum of this particular molecule. All right, so the one thing that I, I want you to notice is that you do have a peak that falls slightly above 3000, right? Specifically at 3076. And this is indicative of a CH bond being present where the carbon to which that hydrogen is bound is an sp2 carbon. In other words, an alkene CH bond. So this right here is already telling us what's the story, right? So the, before with the IHT, we knew there was going to be a double bond or a ring. But now, because of the presence of that peak at 3070, we know that we're dealing with an alkene. And another um, indication of that is that at 1650, we do have a you know, medium strength peak associated with a carbon-carbon double bond. Um, all right, so, and then you have a few other peaks, but these ones are a little bit harder sometimes to kind of gauge as to what you are dealing with. Uh, the most important one, I would say, is this, the one at 1650 that's uh, corroborating the idea that you do have a carbon-carbon double bond. Um, and then the fact that you have this peak slightly above 3000 corroborates the idea that you have a CH bond on the alkene itself. Okay, so we've ruled out the ring structure. Now we have an alkene. All right, so it's time to look at the NMR to try to figure out some spectral features. Now, um, we're going to start with the carbon NMR. And the thing to remember about carbon NMR is that, uh, first of all, all the peaks are going to be singlets. You're never going to have multiplets of any kind for uh, carbon NMR, uh, simply because the probability of having two carbon-13 isotopes right next to each other in the same molecule is virtually uh, impossible. <laughs> well, I shouldn't say impossible, but the probability is very, very, very low. So it rarely ever happens. Now, the other thing too is that the number of peaks that you see is exactly how many inequivalent carbons your molecule possesses. Uh, and, you, and you see right here, you have one, two, three, four, five peaks, which means that you're going to have five inequivalent carbons. Uh, now, the one that is present um, farthest downfield on the carbon NMR spectrum has to be the most substituted uh, alkene carbon um, because it is the most oxidized as well. Um, and then 
the other peak that falls in the 100, you know, 150 region, which also corresponds to the alkene carbon, um, this one is a little bit more upfield. So this is going to be more reduced compared to that one. So the oxidation state will be two minus versus zero. Um, and then the other three peaks are representative of alkyls. All right, so uh, the thing to remember right now is that the formula is C5H10. And from the carbon NMR, we've already seen that all five of those carbons are in equivalent. So none of them can be similar to each other. All right, so we're going to keep that idea. We know there's an alkene. We know that there is a CH bond on the alkene. And we know that all five carbons have to be in equivalent. So it's time to look at the proton NMR and see what data we obtain from, you know, from the spectrum. All right, so here are the peaks, you know, and, uh, exactly where they fall. So these are the delta shifts of the peaks. And one thing that you will notice is that you got a peak very close to the 5 to 6 ppm region as expected for a CH bond of an alkene, right? That's the expected region, 5 to 6 ppm. This is slightly below it, but close enough to still count as an alkene peak. Um, and then you have the other ones that fall between one and two, which are representative of your typical alkyls. So now what we need to pay attention to is the multiplicity. Now, first of all, we do have a triplet right here that integrates to three H's, and we have a quartet that integrates to two H's down there. In addition, there is a singlet that integrates to three H's and a doublet of doublets, which integrates to two H's. Um, and so this is telling you that you actually have two protons that are bound to the alkene carbon. All right. Um, now here I'm presenting the HH coupling constants for those particular splittings. And we can use this information to make some judgment calls as to you know what's happening. Um, and you'll see how we're going to utilize that information in a second. But the first thing that I want to definitely take care of is the multiplicity of some of these peaks. So the first one right here, the one that is highest upfield on the spectrum, notice that it has a triplet um, shape associated with it. It's basically a triplet, right? And I'm kind of telling you that right here as well. All right, so the only way you're going to have these hydrogens, these three hydrogens being split into a triplet is if you have two hydrogens next door, okay? And likewise, if you look at this quartet, well, the only way you're going to have this quartet that integrates to two H's is that if these two H's are next to a carbon with three H's, aka a methyl carbon. So when you look at this thing, you can tell, oh, wait a minute, these two H's need to be next to three um, hydrogens, and the three hydrogens need to be next to two H's for you to end up with a triplet that integrates to three protons and a quartet that integrates to two protons. In other words, this combo of triplet to quartet in a three to two ratio is indicative of you having an ethyl group. So these two pigs are basically part of that same substituent, the ethyl group. And this one right here, that is a singlet with three H's, well, that looks very, very much like a methyl group, but a methyl group that has to be bound to a carbon next door that doesn't have any H's bound to it. All right, so we have an ethyl group, and then we have a methyl group. And these two guys need to be bound to carbons that do not have H's. Otherwise, you would not have a quartet here. You will have a multiplet, and this will not be a singlet. It will be something else. So both the CH2 of the ethyl as well as the CH3 here um, have to be bound to a carbon that, has in, that doesn't have any H's. All right, but... Before you start trying to guess what it's going to be, one thing that's helpful is to count how many carbons you have accounted for. Remember that this structure contains five carbons in total. And as of now, we know that there's going to be an ethyl group and there's going to be a methyl group, which is separate. Okay, so this methyl group is not the one that we have here in the ethyl. Um, what I'm saying is that we're going to have an ethyl group and then there's going to be a separate methyl group present and that accounts for three carbons already. So we're missing two. And you may remember that well, we have to have an alkene, and neither the ethyl nor the methyl are alkenes, right? So the other two carbons have no choice but to be part of a, of the alkene carbon-carbon double bond. All right, so we have some possibilities. 
the alkene could be one in which the ethyl and the methyl groups are trans to each other. And notice that right here we have two hydrogens bound to the alkene carbons, you know, um, representative of the fact that we have an integration of two for that alkene peak. Uh, but they could also be cis to each other, or they could be bound to the same carbon, in which case we have the geminal um, alkene. All right, so one way to tell which one we're dealing with is via the coupling constants. It's not the only way to tell, in fact. Um, but we're going to kind of mention this to kind of give you an idea that, yes, coupling constants can be useful to tell this apart. Uh, you could also use the IR to distinguish which one of these particular isomers you may be dealing with. Uh, but one thing that is useful is uh, the values of the coupling constants. Uh, for a trans alkene, typically the HH coupling constants are kind of high, between 12 and 18 hertz. Uh, whereas the cis alkenes, the HH coupling constants fall between 6 and 12, you know, roughly half the values. But the geminals have the lowest coupling constants between 0 and 3. And notice what coupling constants we have here for this structure between 1 and 3, meaning that this structure has to be the geminal alkene. Or in other words, that's the structure, right? So this is one of the ways in which you can go about finding out the structure. In essence, you are paying attention to all of the features from all of the spectra, and you are taking note of each one of the data that's acquired from each one of those spectra. The mass spec, it gives you the formula, but then from the formula, you can get the IHT. The IHT value tells you some possibilities as to what the structure can be. Then the IR told us, you know, what specific functional group we had in the molecule, which ruled out one of the possibilities of the IHD. And at that point, the carbon NMR and the proton NMR allowed us to come up with the proper structure. So uh, hopefully this will serve as a guidance for you to do these type of problems. I have one more example that I want to go through, uh, but I'm gonna save that example for the next video. So I will see you then.